Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. Today, Duff Gardner is training us on how to design core offers that sell and develop product and marketing strategies around them. Duff, I've got a few questions that will help us get to know you, not as a trainer, but as a human being. The first right. one is this. What is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? So I went through a period in my uh, career about 15 years ago where I went through a series of out of the blue panic attacks. And so that was interesting because um, some people think of that as being nervous, but it's actually kind of not. It's just a, um, it's your body telling you that there's, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. So it ended up feeling like a couple of heart attacks and I, the meetings I was in, the, the situation I was in was kind of random, but uh, uh, so anyway, I was over to able to overcome that. You know, I, it, it ended up kind of getting conflated into fear of speaking funnily enough, which I ended up overcoming. And um, yeah, so that was the biggest one. Okay. Question number two. What's one of your favorite quotes and why is it one of your favorites? All right. Uh, so my favorite quote, I've got it here on my phone, so I don't say it wrong, is a, a fellow by the name of Bayard Rustin. So he was a human rights activist during the time of Martin Luther King. And um, he, was, he was part of, well, I guess he wasn't really part of LGBTQ plus community, but he was a gay man, gay black man. And uh, he said, to be afraid is to behave as if the truth were not true. So that's my favorite quote. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. And the third and final question before you wow us is, what is your favorite way of relaxing? It's having a good conversation with Roger. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the only person who's ever said that. Yeah, well, okay. It's well, actually, that's a close second. But the first one is to go dog walking. I live in Victoria, British Columbia. So um, it's to go for a dog walk out in the woods. Beautiful. And you have a, a uh, you have a dog, right? I do. Of course you do. How could you take what, what else would you do taking something out into the woods? Okay, let's move on. Participants. <laughs> if you have questions during Duff's workshop, please type them into the chat. Uh, I'll batch them and every 10 minutes or so, I'll interrupt Duff and uh, pose your questions to him. Okay. Now you're going to be sent a link to the recording of this talk in a few hours, but I encourage you to take notes anyway, because the very act of taking notes is going to increase what you absorb by as much as 30%. Duff, are you ready to rock the stage? I am. Then take it away. <laughs> the stage is all yours. All right. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this presentation. Um, I'm also a hockey fan. I forgot to throw that in there. So uh, go Canucks. Although we're just, our, my, my poor team has just gone through a COVID attack. So we're going to have to wait. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me, Roger. And thanks for having me here to this presentation today. This is a brand new presentation for me, so I'm excited to hear what you guys think. Uh, a bit of a new format for me. I'm not used to kind of all the bells going off as I speak, but I'm super excited to be here and thanks for having me. So name of the presentation today is called Offers That Sell. And uh, yeah, so that's me. That's me and Victoria here, British Columbia. So before I go deep into my presentation, um, I just thought I'd tell you a little funny story about my name. Um, it's, a, it's an unusual name, of course, Duff. Uh, it's got Scottish origin. And when I was first dating the kid's mother years ago, um, I remember saying to her, you know, you're gonna, this is gonna happen to you. People are gonna come up to you, you're gonna say, this is who I'm dating, and they're gonna say this. And I said, it's gonna go something like this. Who are you dating? Oh, it has, it's a guy named Duff. Uh, Doug? No, Duff. Dave? No, Duff. 
Really? Is it short for anything? No. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, you know what? I've got a neighbor who's got a dog named Buffy. So anyway, that's just kind of a stupid little story, but um, my name is Duff and kind of like the beer in the Simpsons. But uh, the funnily enough, when I go to Starbucks, uh, I, I started collecting pictures of things that people would call me. So Doff, uh, Delph, Dove, I've had all sorts of interesting ones. These are just three. So I live in, in beautiful British Columbia, uh, Victoria here. Um, I, I live kind of up by University of Victoria. I have a home as well over on a little island called Piers Island. That's my view when I look out across the water. And this is my family here. This is my daughter, my son and his girlfriend and uh, my doggie who is named Ronan. <clears throat> and another big thing about me is I'm a huge rescue dog fan. And so Ronan was actually, he's been with us for a year and he is um, a bully breed. And he was in the last batch of dogs that came up across the border uh, before the border was closed because of COVID. Um, and uh, this is his brother Seamus who passed away just before, you know, just over a year ago. And his favorite thing was ice cream. Uh, but just like a little fun thing about us. So let's dive into a little bit about me. Um, why am I here and why am I talking about offers? Well, um, so I had an experience when I was younger uh, where I kind of cut my teeth in the startup world. I had, a, I had a startup that I created in Vancouver right at the tail end of dot bomb, which was smart. And it was called CareWave. It eventually became CareVoyance. And we had a, a really successful run. We won the Canadian Financing Forum we uh, were traveling around with Research in Motion. Uh, we eventually went away, like a lot of companies did at that time, because we didn't quite execute the way we needed to. But uh, there's something that I learned in that experience that has carried, carried me well throughout the years. And that is um, the value of being able to express an offer. So the way we were able to build that business really quickly, the way we were able to uh, access investors, the way we were able to uh, pivot uh, very quickly in many cases was to um, understand how to effectively communicate a good offer in a quick and succinct manner. And we built a formula for that. And as I said, it's kind of held me well in my years of business. In more recent times, I've gone on to um, work more with uh, individual entrepreneurs and uh, help them to grow their business. And so I've worked with people who, um, man, they, they almost had no list. They were transitioning from like a career job. Maybe they had like a list of a hundred people to um, a current launch I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute um, where we're talking about a six or a se potentially a seven figure launch. And so I've kind of run the, run the gamut. Um, I also have been appearing on a bunch of shows recently, podcasts talking about uh, the, uh, the kinds of things that I'm interested in, offers, a process I call startup thinking, these kinds of things. These are just some of the shows I've been on kind of recently. And I've been really fortunate to have some really cool clients in the coaching and digital marketing space. These are just a few of them here. Um, Amy Jo Kim at Game Thinking Live, based in the Bay Area, uh, Lucrative Luminary, based in Vancouver, uh, Thrive Academy, based in uh, just south of the South Bay, um, Steve Olsher and Podcast Magazine in San Diego, uh, Christy Whitman in Phoenix. And so I've had a nice cross section of clients. And more recently have gotten into uh, podcasting. So I have a podcast now. We're up to about 60 episodes. Um, I think we're just about to be featured on in Podcast Magazine next month. And uh, this fellow is, of course, listening to my podcasting and ha having a fantastic time. So Off My Duff is a podcast for uh, folks who are just starting out in business and trying to kind of get that early lift. Um, so we've been interviewing some awesome guests, having a lot of fun doing so. 
And um, I always I always end every podcast by saying, teach what you love and live from your truth. So that's kind of my little tagline. Um, now, Roger, do you want me listening to the questions as well, or should I just keep carrying on? No, you just carry on. I'll interrupt you whenever there is a question and seek your blessing to pose it to you. At that <laughs> okay. Time. All right. Excellent. Now, uh, I just realized I may not have shared something that I needed to share, so but that's okay. Um, let's just see. So I'm going to play this. If I don't, if it, if I didn't share properly, I might unshare and reshare. So just a second here. Uh, so this is one of uh, a local Vancouver fellow who I interviewed recently, Tyler Basu, who had a we had a great interview. And uh, let me just let me know if you can hear this. Um, Be stubborn. Yes with your goals, but flexible with yes, your strategy. But the volume is quite um, low. In the past 10 years, it's kind of funny. Um, when I was like 19 or 20, I wrote this letter, a letter to myself that I dated like five years into the future and describing like what I wanted my life to look like. Right. And I came across this letter because it's saved on in, in, in my Google Drive, came yeah. across it the other day. And I realized that the life that I'm living today is almost to a T, a little better in some areas uh, than what I had written in that letter. Anyway, these are the kinds of interviews that we have. So we, we talk to people about their origin stories. I love asking them about resistance and how that relates to their business. And um, I always ask them for their biggest insight in business. So anyway, I'm having a blast talking to all sorts of different kinds of service-based entrepreneurs as they talk about how they kind of got started in business. And the podcast is called Off My Duff, the Entrepreneur Podcast. You can find it on all the different platforms. Be stubborn. All right. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, yeah. So um, you know, like, and I, 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 uh, I guess right now I'm not speaking live. I'm speaking more virtually, but. Uh, you'll sometimes find me on the speaking circuit talking about these kinds of things, and this is me talking at a conference down in. Um, I think this might have been in Tampa and uh, talking about things like offers that sell and, uh, and what have you. Yeah, so uh, let's, let's talk more about you and less about me now and I'll jump into this section. Um, so if you're here in listening to this presentation, uh, chances are you are some type of service-based entrepreneur and you have a dream. And that dream is to, of course, have a successful service-based business. And I think the interesting thing about the times we're living in, um, there's a statistic that was published just over a year ago by, um, it was one of the freelancing sites. I just, for some reason, I can't remember the one. And they were talking about the uh, rise of people who are self-employed. And so their point to that, they, they did a research study and they came to the conclusion that over 51% of the active workforce will be in some form of self-employment in the next year. And of course, during COVID, that trend has leapt 10 years forward. So whether it's you folks that are here on the call, people that you work with, the reality is that um, a good chunk of us are spending at least part of our time with some kind of service-based business and uh, that business is online. So if you have that dream or if clients that you're working with are having a dream, what's difficult now is because there's this groundswell of people moving online, it is very, very difficult to stand out. Um, it often feels like a complete impossibility. Uh, for those of you, if, for people who know me, if I get presented with a Rubik's cube or something like that, <laughs> some people go at her, I go for a coffee, that's me. Um, and you know, the leap is scary for a lot of people, it's hard. It can be expensive, it can be a, a real challenge to step into an online business. Um, I have this thing called the triple L. And so I think a lot of us fall into the triple L. So um, what that means is we feel lost, we feel alone, and we feel left behind. Does anyone, just type in the chat if anyone has experienced 
feeling either lost in terms of how to having to having to create an online business that's successful, feeling alone, just really missing the 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 in-person interactions that you typically get when you're in a more um, active and social environment, even pre-COVID. And you could type alone in the chat box if you want, if uh, or left behind, I'm sorry, left behind, if you're finding that a lot of these tactics that are kind of coming on stream are just making you feel like a bit of an old goat. I'm 55 and you know there's new things every day. And so I find that we're always having to learn new things every day. Uh, I'm going to quote the famous philosopher Milan Lucic right now. <laughs> now, if you guys don't know Milan Lucic, he's, he's a hockey player. He's from Vancouver, actually Burnaby, British Columbia. Unfortunately, he doesn't play for our local team. He currently plays for one of the competitive teams. And what Milan said the other day uh, kind of resonated with me. And I think it's kind of what a lot of people are feeling like these days. And uh, he said this, he said, we've got to stop hoping and we got to start winning some games. So what I want to talk to you guys today about is how you can start winning some games with your service-based business so you can start to realize that dream business. And so what we're going to specifically talk about today in this training are the three blind spots that are killing your revenue in your service-based business. We're going to talk about the number one core muscle your business needs to generate traction anytime and anywhere. And we're going to talk about um, how to, uh, that should say go, <laughs> from having a crazy dream to joining the 10K a month club. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count down these re three revenue killers in reverse order. Now I had a really cool logo that was in here, which apparently is missing. So we're just gonna go with the non-cool logo unless it shows up down later. All right, so we're gonna talk about revenue killer number three. And the revenue killer number three is something that I call the irresistible rabbit hole. So now I, I noticed that in the, when you guys were first entering the room, there's some people who have quite a lot of online marketing experience, I think, I'm guessing. Um, I think there's some of you that maybe have less. This idea of irresistibility is a, is a pervasive concept in digital marketing. And it comes from, I believe, uh, a fellow that wrote a book just over a decade ago uh, where he was talking about an irresistible offer. The idea of irresistibility is sound. The only thing is what it kind of manifests like for us as we step into trying all these different kinds of digital marketing tricks is it turns into perfectionism. So what ends up happening is we end up kind of jumping around in and out of these rabbit holes, um, trying to create perfect messaging or perfect programs. And so when we try to create these perfect messages and these perfect programs, Inevit inevitably, um, what ends up happening is the marketplace says no. You know, you learn, um, you learn this in the startup world that um, building something that I think a lot of us who are my age remember that dot bomb, large, dot bomb largely happened because uh, people had a lot of money they built these very complicated things, but they hadn't figured out that people actually wanted those things yet. So they had these very exp elaborate, expensive widgets um, that people just didn't want to buy and therefore things started to implode. So when you try to create something perfect without the market feed, with the feed, without the feedback from the marketplace, inevitably what happens is you get to climb. When you get declined, the next thing that happens in the cycle is you start to feel this internal resistance. You, you want to keep pushing forward. You don't know how to push forward. You can just feel the resistance in your body. It feels like a brick wall. I love this picture. Well, not really, but. Um, and what ends up happening when you feel this brick wall 
is this thing called cognitive dissonance kind of kicks in and you just end up doing the same thing over and over and over again. So just type in the chat if you've ever done that. If you've ever tried something, you realize that you're trying to be too perfect, um, you, you put it out into the marketplace, it just really, you got crickets. And then you start to build this resistance and you just keep trying, 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 trying over and over and over again. Yeah. All right. So what, I, what I've learned is what you actually want to be is investable. When you're investable, people begin to know, like, and trust you. So they, they want to spend their hard-earned money with you. You're not, you're not trying to kind of stand up in a soapbox. You're actually getting people to lean in to both your message and your product. So when you're designing an offer, the first revenue killer is just this idea of being trying to be irresistible. And instead, you really want to be investable. I'm going to tell you about a, cl a client of mine, Maura, who um, learned all about this. Um, I'm just going to play a little clip from her. And hopefully you guys can hear it. Wonderful. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, I, this is so exciting because I, I, you know, this is why I love you so much because we have these great conversations and I, I swear we usually have some kind of an amazing download and it feels like that just happened. It did. Oh. Yeah. Wow. That was cool. Thank you for helping me get to that. And thank you. Thank That's you. Awesome. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you on behalf of me and everyone else. That's amazing. Um, so I'm um, wonderful. Oh. There we go. So I, I'm not going to go back to that. So don't want to hear more, hear that again, but uh, more is an interesting case study because um, there's two interesting things about Maura. Number one is how she became a client. You might have recalled when Roger first introduced me, I had said that I'd had these panic attacks and I had to kind of work my way through it and um, get better at presenting. So I hit a point where um, this was a thing for me and I was fortunate because I'd met a lot of people and I'd been in service to a lot of people who were doing quite well. And a friend of mine named Jackie, she's from Calgary, Alberta, uh, was on the cusp of just having a huge breakthrough in her business. In fact, she had over a half a million dollar weekend soon after we started um, working together. And um, she, she basically said to me, I'm gonna go on a speaking tour. Do you wanna come along with me? And I said, sure, because I knew in my heart, like I needed to sort this out. So I started and I went on a multi-city speaking tour. And it was interesting because we spoke to huge groups anywhere from 250 to 300 to five. And so the interesting thing about Maura is she became a client in a room of five. So she's based in Seattle and we had organized this presentation. We we're all excited to have all these great Seattle people there and five people showed up. Um, I think Jackie got one client, I got one client out of, out of the five. Um, but was, what was interesting about Mora and what, what it's relevant to this topic is the entire reason that she became a client for me was even though I was a little bit bummed out that we only had five people at this workshop, I was super dialed into the offer. Like there was, this, there was, there was no doubt. That was the one thing that was clear. And so she basically cut me a check on the spot and she became a, um, uh, like a $5,000 client right on the spot. Um, the other cool thing about Mora is she's rebranded now. So now she's rebranded as soul for the leader and um, she's just doing amazing things in this world. Just in the last couple of months, she had her first like big launch or kind of bigger launch rather than kind of just one-off clients. And her first launch was $40,000. So um, anyway, she's doing amazing things in the world. And uh, Maura Barkley, I'd, I'd recommend you follow her. She's an amazing person. The second revenue killer, if you call, we're counting down backwards, is what I call the blueprint monkey mind, keeping with my animal theme here. 
<laughs> and uh, so what is the blueprint monkey mind? So one thing, you, another thing you get to know about me, my, my grad degree is in learning science and information technology. So I, I can geek out on learning science. I can geek out on cognition and these kinds of topics. And um, one interesting thing that's happening in the online marketing space as more and more people come into the space is, um, you know, that big question of like, how do I do this is popping up for everybody. How do I do the marketing? How do I design the products? How do I grow my company? These kinds of things. Um, how do I have the right mindset to do this stuff? How do I get the right help to be supported? All these big how questions. And so our, we're being challenged in terms of our capabilities. Um, we, we seem to feel that we don't know how. And so what's happening is we're defaulting to what we know. And what we know is how we were raised as kids in the school system, how we grew up, the system of education. So I want to talk about that in a minute. But, uh, you know, all these systems that we're being presented with in the digital marketing space can, fe can feel incredibly complex. And at the same time, uh, there are people who are doing really well who just look at the digital space as one big ball pit, hopefully a clean ball pit. <laughs> it's a very non-COVID friendly ball pit uh, imagery. I'm just thinking about it. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is like in, in, in the digital world, it can literally, this is the example I use with people. It can literally make us feel like we don't know how to create our own damn peanut butter sandwich. You know, there's, there's people buying things, you know, it's like the peanut butter sandwich blueprint. I can tell you how to build the best peanut butter sandwich ever when all we really need to do is follow our intuition. You know, it may not be the perfect peanut butter sandwich, but it's pretty darn good. So I want to talk briefly. I want to go too deep into this, but it's something that I believe strongly in. And that is how this system of education that we've all grown up in is impacting entrepreneurship in ways that are subtle and kind of sneaky and we maybe don't notice. If you think about how we've got raised in school, there's four scripts that end up running in our head and actually end up driving a lot of what we do do and what we don't do. The first one is fear of making mistakes. You know, uh, don't, uh, I don't think I even have to elaborate on that. So fear of making mistakes. But what we know in the startup world in particular is that the way to be successful in business is to actually fall in love with the problem and to treat the experience of your business and, and how you iterate through the different stages of your business in such a way that it's like a sandbox. You know, you're, you're, you're testing things, you're constantly testing, you're stepping into new ideas you're soliciting feedback, um, you're treating it like a fun experience. Um, so if you flip the fear of making mistakes into kind of leaning in to the business and doing it in a way where you're gathering regular feedback and iterating your way, um, this, this is really important. The second script that kind of lingers with us from the system of education is a focus on memorization. I don't know, type in the box if you've gone down the rabbit hole of Reddit, Quora, just general Googling, uh, Facebook, type memorize in the chat. There's something in us that's been ingrained in us that makes us want to go around and collect nuts before we take action. And it all goes back to the beginning when we were learning how to sort of be successful in school. It's this focus on memorizing, collecting nuts, uh, instead of um, the act of just play, of curiosity, 
of just being genuinely curious about where you're going. Um, you know, the hallmark of a great business is this interplay between iteration, which is where you're getting feedback from the marketplace and ideation, where you're internally triggering the creativity that you need and the innovation to make things happen. So just being genuinely curious going forward is part of the challenge. So that's, that's the way you wanna be. Um, again, focusing on gathering nuts. Um, you know, um, back in the day, uh, apprenticeship, and it still is a big thing, but when we value um, interactions with others over, how do I wanna say this? You know that scene in Winnie the Pooh where he sits on a log and goes, think, 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 think. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Definitely type in Pooh in the chat box. <laughs> That's Pooh with an H, by the way. Pooh with an H, as in Winnie. Um, but, you know, like if you find yourself doing that, um, how many times have you just gone out and asked a friend, asked a mentor, uh, asked your community a question that saved you six months. So for some reason, when we get kind of stuck in this path or this journey into going to online marketing, on, on, online uh, world of business, um, we focus more on the information than the collaboration that we really need to ideate and iterate our way into a new opportunity. And the final script that kind of hangs with us is to chase abstract goals like an A. So what we know, so I'm, I'm a, I, I studied this philosophy in the realm of cognitive science, which is called situative cognition. And so what that basically means is like as human beings, we are driven to learn new things by the situation that we are in. So I'll just give you a basic example of what this looks like. Um, if you've ever said, I gotta lose 10 pounds, right? We were talking offline before this started, COVID, I gotta lose 10 pounds. It's, what is 10 pounds? It's like getting an A in school. How many people have ever lost 10 pounds when they say that? It ends up being kind of like one of those false af affirmations. So instead, if you said to yourself, man, that just for example, I'm getting married in six months and I'm going to fit into that outfit in six months if it's the last thing I do. So that situation of being married, seeing an outfit that you like um, is going to drive you to achieve the goals that you want rather than the abstract idea of losing 10 pounds. This idea is so simple. It's kind of basic when you say it, but we, what, what we all end up doing in this online marketing world, when we start to doubt ourselves when we start to fear and worry that we're not doing the right thing and we're not feeling capable enough we default to chasing these abstract goals which in their in and themselves are meaningless i feel like it's one of the biggest blind spots of entrepreneurship today as more and more people go into entrepreneurship completely conditioned around these four scripts in our head and it and it just it just doesn't work so instead, when you focus on deeply meaningful goals, things start to shift. And you know, one of the most important things you can be, ways you can be um, in the online marketing world and when you have a business like this is to be nimble. The best way to be nimble is to flip the script, switch, flip those four things around so that you're, you're stepping into the ability to adapt and adjust and step into opportunity as it presents itself to you. I want to talk about a client, Dr. Jean LaCour. They're an interesting agency. Um, I did some work with just recent, just late last year and early into this year. Um, they have, um, it's, it's kind of a hybrid nonprofit, for-profit in Florida. For years, Dr. Jean has been helping people overcome addiction and step into, to, to, into their journey of sobriety. And they have a for-profit training agency that they go into companies and train companies. Of course, during COVID, um, rates of addiction, addictive behavior are spiking like crazy. 
this is something we're going to be talking about for years because now we have all these virtual workers and they're getting into bad habits around addiction. And so the, I forget the statistics, but it's, it's, it's a huge, huge spike. So they're trying to position themselves to take advantage of this opportunity as a company, but of course, to impact more people in the world as they go forward and to kind of understand their business model and how that best can work. With your help, I mean, Dev, we cannot underestimate your brilliance in this. As we came to you saying, how should we approach this very complex, scary con you know, concept? Right. And you said, wow, a brown bag is pretty non-threatening, isn't it? Maybe we could do something with that lunch bag and we could talk about it over lunch. And, you know, as we just began to grow with this, it came up to our entire new launch campaign of Break the Silence, Start with Lunch. With your So Dr. Jean is great. And so that's just one of the little things that we help them to kind of sort out. They have a huge mission and they are, um, they're helping people all over the world step into a life of sobriety. So both as a nonprofit and as a for-profit agency. Uh, all right, so let's get to the number one revenue killer. And again, I feel bad because I have a, an amazing logo, which for some reason did not get into this presentation. Um, but this is uh, my first rescue pup, Seamus, who also is, um, uh, the mascot, I didn't put a slide in here for this, but one of the things I do as well locally here in Victoria is I'm a part owner of a franchise, Men in Kilts Victoria, which is part of a North America wide franchise, but we have the first arm's length franchise in Men in Kilts. And in Victoria, we are in seven, well, of course, we're not right now during COVID, but in any given year, we would typically be in seven parades. All the guys that work for the company wear kilts and uh, they clean in kilts. And uh, my role in the company is kind of more on the sort of supporting it side, but I get to go in these, these parades. And Seamus uh, was our mascot. He's a celebrity in Victoria. He's passed away a year ago from a fast cancer, um, but uh, he's well known in Victoria, British Columbia as the mascot for men in kilts and uh, was going around and changing people's minds about bully breeds. One kiss at a time on the parade route. So the number one revenue killer for people stepping into online business is not having an offer that sells. I don't think that's a mystery because that's the name of the presentation, right? But uh, uh, it's very true. So here's the thing that I learned in the startup world back in the day is that um, there's a rigor to the process of creating a technology startup. Um, you know, I remember we had a three-story st post and beam office with that very first startup that I created back in, you know, early 2000s. Um, for those of you who know Yale Town, it was just above Rodney's Seafood Bar. And we, um, <clears throat> what I learned in that process is, uh, that rigorous process is things like, well, let's put it this way. We, would, we, we prepared for one five minute presentation for probably three months. You know, we would be up all night sorting out some of the topics that you need to know. And what I find is that people who are stepping into entrepreneurship, uh, instead of creating a, like a solid core offer, what they end up doing is creating panic offers. I see it all the time, even with some of my very large clients. They are in mid-launch and they're throwing together their offer on the fly. And what happens is it looks a lot like this. And so the, the, the problem is, you know, they, you, they or you or, you know, people are kind of making this revenue killing mistake. Um, what ends up happening is you're focusing on things like, okay, what are the attributes of the product? Um, I mean, when one person came to me at one point, she had spent 18 months on a, on a project. She'd spent over six figures on this project and now she wanted to market it. Uh, or the other side of that is um, I've, I've had people who are so brilliant, 
you know, come into my sphere. They're so incredibly brilliant. And, um, you know, I, I check back in with them 18 months later and they are man caving that messaging like you have no idea. They just can't get past the perfectionism um, around that. And so when you think of the offer as kind of being the glue in between your product and your marketing message, um, it needs to be what you communicate to people in such a way that they understand what it is or what, how you're intending to help them and, and, and how you're intending to kind of walk with them hand in hand through that process. When you struggle, when you don't have a solid offer, when it's slapped together at the last minute, when it has pieces in it that are broken, if it doesn't make sense to people, um, it becomes the pink elephant in the room. <clears throat> people can smell it. They can absolutely smell it. When I, I told you about more earlier, when, when I presented there and sh she was part of that group, the, the offer was super clear. There was nothing fancy. It was just me. And I knew exactly what I was offering. I knew exactly how I was going to communicate it, how I was going to express it, how I was going to deliver it. Simple. You can have a good offer that you've worked on, that you've mapped out, and that's it. And you can have one discovery call with someone that can turn into a, you know, five, off, a five-figure client. I have clients that have, I have clients who have clients that pay them $90,000 a year to work with them. <clears throat> so a lot of these things that I've talked about today, uh, I have kind of pulled together into a process that I call startup thinking. And it's really startup thinking is the process that I've designed to help people go kind of from that, you know, wanting to have some kind of a dream business to stepping into um, having something that's more sustainable, that's profitable, that's working. Um, you know, back to my startup roots, we, there's this, in Vancouver, we have this conference called traction.io for the startup community. And the idea of traction is something that I know really well. You know, traction, if you have an online business and you're service-based, it basically means five things. It is um, clients, sales, gigs, fans, and deals. So those five things. So what we do is we help people uh, get more traction in their business around those five metrics. And it's through this process called startup thinking. Now, right before the Olympics, I had a, I had a position um, um, as one of the leadership people within the digital marketing community in, in British Columbia. And that was kind of a fun time in Vancouver because there were, uh, as an in industry-wide, it was when um, over 50,000 people working in the industry. Um, so I was working on projects like uh, the very early days, like the very early days of budgeting the, the, the um, MDM, which is the Center for Digital Media in Vancouver, um, a, a big mobile um, innovation project called Mobile Muse. Um, so I was having a lot of interaction with um, people in the games industry. And what I realized in working with them is there's this concept in games called the magic circle. And so the magic circle is the place that the game designer creates where the people who are in the game don't want to leave. It's kind of like suspended reality. They're having so much fun in that magic circle that they don't want to leave. And the outside world is the outside world. In the context of business, it's that place and time when your business starts to have momentum in such a way um, that opportunity expands and time stands still and you're seeing the momentum in your business. So I think of that as a magic offer because when you have a magic offer, that's the experience, not just of yourself as the person who's delivering the, these, these programs and services, but it's the experience of the people that are, you're leading. So in the, in the last couple of minutes here, I wanna kind of rattle through 
um, this process of startup thinking that I learned in the context of having a successful startup. So uh, the story around that is, um, you know, we, I, I'm not, I, I was not a tech, tech focused person, but I had this idea. This was sort of late nineties. And um, I just, I had the right mentors. I had the right people I worked with uh, and that's how we got successful. And that's how we ended up winning the Canadian financing forum, which if you don't know is, is the largest one in Canada and Toronto. And there's, I think there's about 250 venture capitalists on the floor, got whisked off to business television. We were research in motion, uh, the, the wireless company at the time, the darling of Canada, we were the very first um, alliance partner. And so we got to present in front of all these venture capitalists um, this offer, which was five minutes. The formula that we came up with is what I'm gonna show you today. There's, there's eight steps in the formula. These are the things that are, that, that I, when I'm working with people on kind of a longer term basis, these are the things that we sort out uh, with a view towards making offers that actually convert, okay? So it's a very different process. So in other words, if I'm working with someone on their offers, yes, we'll get into bonus stack. Yes, we'll get into pricing. Yes, we'll get into, you know, how are you unique? What's your messaging? All those typical things. And I do have a process for all that as well. Um, but uh, woven into that, uh, depending on what level you're working at me with, are these eight things, okay? So I'm gonna count them down really quickly here. The first one is your premise. What is, what is your business designed to prove as true? What is the opportunity that you're stepping into? And how do you define it and how do you measure it and how do you communicate it clearly, not just to others, but to yourself? How are you unique? Um, I go deep with people on this, uh, the next one as well, um, in terms of how you're unique. And I have a unique way of thinking about this. Um, I'm gonna stop here for a quick second. You know, when we step into digital marketing and we start thinking about like our niche and how we're unique and like, you know, how people, like I found a really interesting way to think about that is imagine that there's 10 people exactly like you offering very similar services. They're not exactly like you, but they're offering the same services. How does your ideal client choose? How do they choose? So whenever you're falling into the trap of sameness, going around and comparing yourself to others, just keep that in mind that the name of the game is not to blend in to the 10, it's to actually stand out and be the crazy one that they hire. That, that's, that, that's what you need to be doing. Um, when I work with people on an ongoing basis, there's five things that we sort out. And those five things are the formula to standing out and having a unique point of view, okay? Uh, value proposition, so how are you valuable? Uh, I actually go really deep with people on this one too. I do remember eating a lot of Thai food in Yale Town, going over this particular one, like actually coming up with hard data, which proved why we were valuable. So this is one thing that I get, I go really deep with clients on, because I find that they don't want to go there because it's a bit of work, but it's it's so valuable and it's so fruitful when you do, because then you can communicate why people should hire you in a super clear and super succinct way. What is a leadership? What is your leadership? That can be you, it can be the partners you work with. If you're working with virtual assistants, business partners, um, joint venture partners, um, anyone that you're working with end up becoming part of your leadership group. Uh, in, the, in the eyes of the people who are potentially hiring you. What does that look like? And making intentional choices around that. How are you executing? What is your business model? Um, are you based on a launch model? Are you based on evergreen? Are you, you know, is it all about small events into discovery calls? This is really important to sort out. Um, the less random, the better. Okay, the less random, the better on how you're going to execute. We have an expression in the startup world, execution is everything. It's true. Um, how you execute is absolutely going to impact your ability to, to grow and scale. Knowing how you're going to, your business model connects 
uh, is important too in terms of your trustworthiness because if your if if your model is not believable, how are people going to believe you to hire you to trust you that you're going to help them? Uh, money. Uh, there has to be a believability to the money that you're investing in the business. Um, you know, if somebody says to me, I want to do Facebook ads and I want to, I want to do Facebook ads over the next three weeks, I can tell right away there's a business model issue and they don't understand how the money that they're going to invest in that particular model is going to support their growth. And alignment. How does it align with your life? How does it align with what you want to do in the future? Do you have an exit plan? These are the things that you need to sort out. So these are the things that I work with, through with people when I work with them as we start designing high level offers. Um, and that's why a core offer is so important. I have this expression, conviction begets conversion. Those eight things build conviction. It, it allows you to communicate in such a way that you're leaning in to the conversation with people so they can lean in to the engagement. Now, I don't Jeff, want to talk- Are you open to a question? Sure. Uh, I'm seeing more and more online offers that have a section in the offer where the thing being sold is broken down into micro steps and each micro step is allocated a value such that you add, when you add them all up, it comes to this astronomical number pick a hundred thousand dollars in, in order to demonstrate that the price being asked at five hundred dollars mm -hmm. is an amazing deal to me my eyes roll when i see something like that please comment sure um yeah i think like um I call that thud. I mean, a way to think thud is in T-H-U-D, like poop. <laughs> you know, even more than the price issue is like, what does the stack represent, uh, the bonus stack? So uh, like when you're, um, I'll give you one hint. So if you, if, you, if you listen to anything that I say today, here's one trick. When you're creating bonuses, and those are those itemized things, uh, as long as they line up with an objection that's not time money that your, that your ideal client might have. So like if you had a bonus, if you're a productivity expert and one of the bonuses that you offer is some kind of a physical book that they can use, that would solve the objection that I'm not an online person so much and I just need something that, 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 you know, that, I, can, that I can write in. Maybe you figured out that that's one of the objections that people sometimes have from joining you. So that's a great bonus. Um, how you price that is entirely up to you. So I would say that, um, you know, um, it, it, there's, a mo there's, there's probably a day of reckoning coming where people are scrutinizing these prices a little bit more. The marketplace is being a little bit more commoditized. And, you know, people are going to stop believing some of these, these numbers. On the other hand, there's still, you know, a, a conventional wisdom that lives in the marketplace, which is more is better. I don't really know what the right answer is. I can just tell you that from my perspective and when I work with clients, uh, building trust is the most important thing. You don't build trust by throwing jello at the wall. You just build trust by being super clear about these eight things I was just talking about. Those things, find their way into the way that you define the offer. Perceived value is a really big thing here. You know, if, if, if I perceive that you're gonna be able to help me get from A to Z, I can make my own internal calculation and choose, you know, yes or no. If it crosses over to the point of, as you're saying, ridiculousness, ridiculousness then of course that trust is broken. Anyway, I mean, it, it, that, but this is why working on your offer is so incredibly important. Generally, when you see unbelievable numbers like that, it means that people are slapping stuff together. It's a panic offer. Okay. So when I work with people, um, 
generally, like we have a couple of ways I work with people kind of, I have uh, clients are kind of consulting. Um, I have a year long program, which is called the incubator where I work with people on an ongoing basis. Um, and we have some short term stuff that we do as well. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to have a chat about anything that I've talked about today. I think Roger put something in the chat. You can go to um, offers that sell.com forward slash book. And if you opt in there, uh, I will send you our little book that we're putting together. Um, and you'll get that sometime in the next week um, for you guys. So it's offers that sell.com forward slash book. And if you, you can put that in the chat, Roger, and people are, can go ahead and, uh, and I will send you uh, my new little book that's coming out. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about, I'm actually in a launch right now, uh, Audio Domination. This is my client, Steve Ulsher. And um, we're, we're in pre-launch right now. We just crossed six figures. Um, and a big part of what we're working on is an offer in something that's kind of new. This, this, he has grown his business to, um, to uh, he, on Clubhouse, which is a new social audio platform. It, since uh, the middle of December, he has grown his audience to 52, 54,000 now followers uh, and 34,000 personally. So that's about 90,000 followers, give or take. Um, and so what's really interesting about working with clients like this, like Steve, is um, they're pushing the edges of what's possible in digital media and trying to kind of uh, give people a snapshot of how they can get traction in their business, like I talked about earlier um, in those five metrics um, through his program called Audio Domination. Um, I, I, um, I think that uh, I can go through some quick slides. We're kind of coming to the end here, but uh, you know, I've got a few slides here on how I work together with people. If you're interested, you know, basically I break it down into sections like we conceive the idea, we build a context around the business, we we start to build the content, we build uh, enrollment techniques. How do we connect emotionally with people so that they feel comfortable, know, liking, and trusting us enough to give us their money, and then we start working. Finally, at the last step, we start working on is not just how to put together that offer, but how to actually come up with um, enrollment conversations that are easy and simple and um, are almost like an extension of a natural conversation. Uh, so this is, this is the book here, it offers a sell the eight step revenue breakthrough system. Again, if you wanna put your name in, the, uh, uh, in this, uh, this is the URL here actually. Uh, I will make sure to send you that book here in the next week. And uh, you can check that out and tell me what you think. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 I'm just about at the end here. I know this is another question, Roger, but uh, I have an expression that I say at the end of every podcast. And I say to people to teach what you love and to live from your truth. And so what I mean by that is I believe that we're, living in this time where we have a responsibility to transfer the knowledge that we have and to keep learning at the same time. I think it's easy, like I'm 55 now, and sometimes for people my age, it's really easy to think that you don't know anything anymore, that you don't have anything to give. It's the, op the opposite is actually true. So by just kind of, I think, you know, um, if you do happen to be around my age, I think it's really important is just to spread love, step into what you know, and, and to teach what you love. So um, thank you so much for having me today. It's been really fun meeting with you folks. Um, and, I, and I hope, I don't know, Roger, if that little gray thing was appearing in the presentation, but I hope not. Um, but thank you so much, everybody. It's been really nice to speak to you. And uh, Duff, there's a question from Chris. Uh, what's the form of the book? Is it an ebook that you'll be sending, or is it a paperback, or what? Uh, it's it's an ebook, and if you um, get it and you want a physical book, you just let me know, and you can be one of the first few people. <laughs> okay, so it takes the form of an ebook as a PDF. It's a PDF to start. Great, and and it will not be delivered right away because we're just making some final edits to it, so it'll go out in the next week. Lovely. Duff, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us.
Thank you. You have a way of uh, looking at things that is uh, unlike uh, any that I've ever heard before. Uh, so I'm uh, absolutely certain your unique perspective will be of value to many of the EIN members. So I thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having me. It was really fun to be here.